And, and, and those of you who are big Trump fans don't get too, uh, what do you call it, upset. And I, you know, and I know I trigger you and, and, uh, and, and I commit all these microaggressions against, uh, against Trump fans, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see where this, uh, where this takes us. I, so I'm going to start actually with something where we can actually something positive I have to say about the Trump administration. You know, not not too significant, not too big, but um, but still a positive. And that is that today, uh, the Trump administration announced that they were exiting the Paris Accord. If you remember, the Paris Accord is an international accord that basically uh, dictates sign or, or dictates reductions. Or it doesn't really dictate. We'll get to that in a minute. But it kind of it kind of encourages encourages. Uh, reductions in CO2 emissions with the idea that, uh, you know, the world is heating up and uh, ice is melting everywhere except, I guess, in my freezer. And, and, uh, and you know, just catastrophic disaster is about to, uh, to hit us all. And the only way around this is for us to reduce our carbon emissions. Now, of course, the funny thing about it is that they don't even take themselves seriously um, because the Paris Accord is a toothless, uh, hollow, you know, I'm quoting, I'm quoting from Commentary Magazine, they could say the document is a toothless, hollow expression of national aspirations that would have almost no effect on global greenhouse gas emissions overall even by the standards of the UN or by the standards of anybody. It's just a completely empty document. So, you know, it's great that the United States leaves. I think it's, a, it's important as a statement that not everybody agrees with this nonsense and this approach to CO2 and, and to, uh, and to uh, you know, supposed climate change, uh, that not everybody agrees to the approach to it. But the fact is the Paris Accord was meaningless. Nobody's actually achieving their uh, stated goals, except the United States, and we'll get to that in a minute. So European Union is way short of its promises. Canada, at the rate they're going right now, will achieve its targets, even with a, a, um, a socialist government, will achieve its targets in roughly two centuries. Two centuries. That's 200 years, right? The only signatories to the Paris Accord that are actually meeting their objectives as stated are Morocco and Gambia, not exactly countries that are going to have any impact whatsoever on CO2, uh, CO2 emissions. Indeed, one, one, of the, one of the, you know, kind of amusing things about the Paris Accords is that China was defined as a developing nation, which it is. It's, it's not a developed nation. It's still a very poor nation in terms of the standard of living of its individual citizens. And as a consequence, it, it, they didn't set targets for China. So China was exempt from any kind of emissions target, uh, targets. And, you know, so it is, it's, it's promised to stop curbing emissions in 2030. By which time, you know, it, it will have emitted dramatically more than it is now. And of course, India, another developing country, is also not subject to any uh, restrictions. And it will, let's see, uh, it will double its carbon emissions from 2012 to 2030. So it's, you know, it's an irrelevant, irrelevant document. The whole Paris Accord is one big joke. And indeed, the reason Trump, uh, Trump can just withdraw, withdraw us from the accord is that Obama, who signed on to the Paris Accord, never actually got Congress to vote on it. So if Congress had voted on it and made it a treaty, then only Congress could approve getting out of it. But because Congress never voted on it, it's been in limbo. It's never really become U.S. a treaty, you know, by which the U.S. has to abide. Trump can just withdraw us easily. Of course, the next president can just put us back in easily. 
Uh, that's a problem of doing stuff without actual legislation. But the funny thing is, the funny thing is, that the United States is actually on target to reduce greenhouse emissions by between 26 and 28 percent from the 2005 level by 2025. But they're on target not because of any grand federal policy. They're on target for a number of different things. One is state restrictions at the state level, states like California and other states that have restricted carbon emissions. But mostly, most of the reason for the fact that we're emitting less, Europe is increasing carbon emissions. In spite of all their investment, in spite of all their focus on alternative energies, they are not decreasing their emissions and they're not anywhere close to the targets they set. But the United States is, primarily because of more efficient cars, more efficient power generation, and basically, and more efficient, you know, extraction industries, and basically the transition to natural gas, which is still a carbon, but far more efficient than uh, oil or coal. So, and coal is disappearing, in spite of Trump promising to save the coal industry. The coal industry is dead, mostly because coal is just too expensive relative to natural gas and relative to the availability of natural gas. So the United States is actually going to meet its standards, whether we are in the Paris Accord or not. So it's good that we're leaving, good signal, good message, good action. Eh. In real life, in terms of actual consequences, not very significant. Uh, because it's not going to change our behavior. I mean, the Trump administration has been pretty good on energy policy. So uh, uh, Perry, Secretary of the Energy, although he's resigning now, was pretty good at allowing more drilling, at, you know, at, at, at actually eliminating some of the penalties for coal and some of the penalties for, for carbon and some of the, uh, the rolling back some of the, the Obama attempts to penalize the energy industry, so, so Perry's been pretty good. Uh, you know, it's sad that we're not seeing a boom in, um, in nuclear energy production. It's sad that we're not seeing um, even a greater expansion in, uh, in oil drilling around the United States. But better than the alternatives in terms of oil production, uh, in terms of energy production, uh, this administration has been. All right, so good riddance. To Paris. Now, so, uh, Capitalist Nick asks, uh, when are you getting Alex, ba Alex Epstein back on the show? Sometime, you know, we'll coordinate schedules. I haven't had many people being interviewed on the show. On Call was the first in a long time. My plan is to resurrect the interview format, and I'm sure Alex will be one of the people. There's still a lot backlist of people who I haven't interviewed yet, which I would like to, which I would like to interview. And then, um, what do I think of the recent debate with Robert Kennedy? I haven't seen it. I'm sure he did great. I haven't seen it. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Seeing it. You know, I'll, maybe I'll comment uh, once I actually see it. But you know, Alex is good at what he does, so uh, I'm sure it was uh, it was good. All right. One other uh, comment on relevant to the whole global, you know, climate change, warming, whatever they want to call it these days, or you know, the catastrophe, the, 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 the global extinction of mankind because of climate change. Um, today, we had a, um, I guess, 11,000 experts. I mean, this is, I'm reading from Bloomberg, but I saw this in other news feeds, so this is coming out of somewhere. I don't know if this is legit or illegit, but this is a press release that's circulating everywhere. More than 11,000 experts, 11,000, I wonder what qualifies them as experts, have signed an emergency declaration warning that energy, food, and reproduction, reproduction must change immediately. Immediately. Or we're all going to die. Why? Because of climate change. And they say 40 years ago, scientists from 50 nations converged on Geneva to discuss what was then called the CO2 climate problem. At the time, with reliance on fossil fuels having helped trigger the 1979 oil crisis, 
They predicted global warming would eventually become a major environmental challenge. Indeed, they made some bold, specific predictions back then, none of, whom, none of which have actually come true. But these 11,000 scientists are now saying, 40 years have gone by and we've done nothing. And they, they say the Paris Accord is meaningless. It's stupid. It's irrelevant. I mean, at best, the Paris Accord, if everybody follows the guideline to the letter, would, redu would reduce the warming by 0.2 degrees centigrade, insignificant, meaningless. So we need drastic change. We need, obviously, to change energy. We need a, a Green New Deal. We need to get rid of fossil fuels. We need to shift to alternative energy. And we need to do it quickly, and we need to do it now, immediately. And of course, we need to change our food supply. Way too many cows farting methane out there. Way too much methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas more supposedly responsible for climate change than CO2 emissions. So we need to stop the cows from farting. The only way to stop the cows from farting is basically to kill them. So we need to stop eating beef, which means killing millions of cows. I don't know if this applies to pork and chicken and others, but basically we should become vegetarians, but even vegetarians, uh, then we have to chop down forests in order to grow more vegetables so we can all eat vegetables. I don't know if that's going to work. But anyway, let's not bother with the details when there's a crisis and we're all going to die if we don't do it. So hysteria. And of course, most importantly, most importantly, we have to get the global population under control. Now, under control is, or stabilized, they say, is code word for population control. It's code word for, for stabilizations, which is what Paul Ehrlich called for in the, in the late 1960s in his book, The Population Bomb. It means one child like policies, like China had. It means coercion on a massive global scale to reduce the number of, God forbid, people. We don't want more people. People are bad. People consume meat, and meat causes the earth to warm. Of course, they say we need to do this carefully, and we need to make sure we use it, do it justly, and with social, you know, in a way that ensures social integrity, whatever the hell any of that means. It means we need to use coercion and force, but gently. And, and given that we have to maintain social justice, maybe we should sterilize the rich first. Now, that's me. That's not them. But maybe we should sterilize rich people first because we don't want to penalize poor people. They're suffering enough. I mean, look, I've said many times that I don't get into the whole issue of... Uh, the science of climate change, I, you know, it would take too much energy for me. I, I'll leave that to Alex Epstein and others. Um, and even Alex doesn't completely just say, no, it's all bogus. But what is clearly bogus is the hysteria. What is clearly bogus is the solutions, are the solutions. If the climate is changing, let's come up with technologies that sustain human life given the changing climate. Let's say it's true that global temperatures are rising. Let's even say it's true that global temperatures are rising significantly. That means if we had a free market, then insurance, insurance policies in places that are going to flood would be rising dramatically right now, incentivizing people to move away from those areas to safer places. That's a great market mechanism to shift populations away from places that might flood. Or you could imagine insurance companies teaming up with homeowners associations, teaming up with towns and cities in areas that were going to flood where, willing, where people were willing to pay for remedial mechanisms like dikes, like flood canals, like all kinds of things like that would reduce the impact of rising sea levels like Amsterdam, which has had dikes for hundreds of years, I think, 
is below sea level. And last time I was in Amsterdam, it was a pretty cool city. Didn't flood, didn't have people running away. So today we have technology far, far exceeds the technology that existed back then. Build dikes. Maybe as it gets warmer, some people have to buy electricity. I mean, not buy electricity, buy air conditioning. And maybe we should start, developers should start thinking about that. Right? Maybe we should deregulate energy markets, make it a true free fall, and thus encourage investment in nuclear, and maybe encourage philanthropists like Bill Gates, who is doing this indeed, to invest in nuclear, because maybe it's not economical to invest in nuclear if it's not a philanthropic venture, but if it's true that the world is about to end, then maybe nuclear energy makes sense and people, philanthropic people, will start investing in it. How about some of that philanthropy money, or just science money with corporations and other, maybe insurance companies who don't want to see insured properties flood, invest in technologies that suck CO2 out of the air? <laughs> There's one technology, I can't remember the university that developed it, that actually sucks the methane out of the air, and it turns methane, which is a, a really bad uh, greenhouse gas, well, assuming the models are correct, into CO2, which is actually not a really bad, so I think methane is five times more damaging than CO2 or something like that. Anyway, you would be able to reduce the greenhouse effect by just turning methane into CO2, and there are machines that can do this. So why not do it? So let's Think about technological solutions that don't involve the end of economic growth, the end of industri industrialization, the end of technological progress, and the end of human life for probably hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, which is what would be involved if we stopped using fossil fuels. So put aside the science. Let's, you know, if there's a real problem, markets will solve it. We will solve it. Individuals will solve it. Technology will solve it. But the very fact that these kind of solutions are rejected by the proponents of climate change, of the hysteria around climate change, suggests to me that they're not serious, that this is all just one big way of motivated by by the ideologues of hatred of mankind, it would be great to shrink the number of people on earth, and it would be great to finally get rid of economic progress, economic growth, industrialization, and technology. That's the real goal of the, of the intellectuals behind this whole movement. They want us to go back to the caves. They really, really, really do want us. And, and they don't want anything for themselves. They just want to in glee watch us all die as they wither away and die as well. But they don't care because their lives are meaningless. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So. I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to youronbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, Show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...